Thanks. And uh, studying with us this evening, in sixth grade, one of the things that we do um, when it comes to our different parts of reading is we talk about um, character studies. And as I was looking at this evening um, at some of my old notebooks when I was preparing for the sermon, I uh, was looking and I noticed how many times I had written JB um, in my notebook. Um, so several years ago, we had one of the brothers who had come to uh, preach, and he was doing a lesson on John the Baptist. Um, and so when Carrie asked me what my title was, I said, well, it's JB. And she's like, what is that? <laughs> I said, well, you know. Um, so I told her when I uh, first really started studying the Bible and stuff, I had a Bible that um, my grandma Ina had. Um, and I was still, I was always constantly getting confused when they talked about John, which John they were talking about. So I wrote in my own little notes, you know, JB for John the Baptist. Um, and then in my shorthand, when I'm taking notes during our sermons, I have JB and I have JC for Jesus the Christ and uh, HS for the Holy Spirit. And so we're going to look at John the Baptist this evening, if you will, with me. Um, I appreciate Gerald keeping me in his prayers. And um, I don't know if I'm too, what's going on with me? Too high, too low? Raise it up. Okay, well, I don't need it. How about the back pocket? Is that better? Okay. All right. Um, but, Alan, we didn't talk about uh, leading that song, um, but I appreciate. Um, that song being led because it talks about how in the kingdom we always have opportunities for work. And when we start looking at John the Baptist, the individual, um, we're going to look at his lineage and things like that. But he had a very specific job to do when it came to the kingdom. Um, and he, unfortunately, was not part of the kingdom of Christ as far as when the New Testament was started because he lost his life before Jesus um, was betrayed and hung on the cross. But as we get to that point, we've got to look at some foundation first. So we're going to look at six different points about John the Baptist individually. Uh, we're going to look at his lineage and how he's mentioned and referred to as the forerunner, um, told about in prophecy in the Old Testament. But his father then, um, on the day of his circumcision, he, after he gets his uh, speech back, he refers to him as this is, you know, the one that was pro prophesied. You will be the forerunner. We're going to talk about how he is referred to as the baptizer. Um, and then we're going to look at, um, you know, John the Baptist, the believer. Um, and I think, and hopefully that'll be what I can drive home as how he can truly affect us as Christians and where we should be, as well as just simply remaining faithful. So we'll start with the idea of the lineage. And I'm sure that many of you know the history and the lineage of John the Baptist, but we're going to be spending a lot of our time this evening in Luke. Um, in Luke chapter 1, we can read about Zechariah. And Zechariah was a priest. And as we go through the scripture, it's very specific on um, Zechariah's lineage as well as what led to John the Baptist. So when we start reading in verse 5 of chapter 1 of Luke, it says, in the days of Herod, king of Judea, there was a priest named Zechariah of the division of Abijah. So if we don't, aren't aware of our Old Testament history, which I know some of you are very good scholars at it, I had to look it up to remember exactly where it was. I remember it being talked about, but that was as far as my brain went. Um, but if we go to 1 Chronicles 24, it talks about how the different priests were put into 24 different groups. Um, and as it was going through, then it mentions in verse 10 where Abijah was. So Abijah was in the uh, eighth group to be designated for their specific job and specific division when it came to um, taking care of the children of Israel and the temple. So we know that John the Baptist's father was from that specific lineage of priests. And then it also talks about that he had a wife and her name was Elizabeth. It says they were both righteous in the sight of God, walking blamelessly in all the commandments and requirements of the Lord. And yet they had no child because Elizabeth was infertile and they were both advanced in years. So we know that they are older, but we can see about Elizabeth um, that we find that she was related to Mary. And as 
his eyes put up there. It says the Mary, right? It's, you know, the Mary that Jesus was born through, um, as the prophecy had foretold it, Jesus would be brought into the world. The Son of God would be born of a virgin. So when we look at Luke 1 a little further down then, we jump into verse 36. It says, as the angel has appeared to Mary, he's telling her, he says, and behold, even your relative. Now that's the uh, New American Standard. The American Standard 1901 also says relative. The King James says cousin. Um, you know, and that's one of those issues. Some people will argue one way or the other. It really doesn't matter. They were related. That's what matters says, Elizabeth herself has conceived a son in her old age, and she who was called infertile is now in her sixth month, for nothing will be impossible with God. Right? So we have this angel telling Mary that she's going to conceive, even though she's a virgin. But not only that, your cousin, your relative, who is older in age, who has been barren all of these years, she's also conceived. But not only does he identify that she has conceived in her sixth month, but has conceived a son. And he's very specific in that statement. When we jump down to 39 and 40, then he says, it says, Now at the t this time, Mary set out and went in a hurry to the hill country, to the city of Judah. She entered the house of Zechariah and greeted Elizabeth. And when Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the baby leaped in her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. All right? Now, obviously, as a guy, I've never experienced that. Um, you know, but those of you who have had babies, you know what that feeling is um, when that baby begins to move inside of your belly. And then as we sit back as husbands and we start seeing it move inside the belly, it kind of weirds us out, at least me. Right? But John, in the womb of Elizabeth, leaps when Mary speaks. So that there's a spiritual connection that is already happening. When we go to verse uh, 8 of Luke 1, going back to Zechariah, says, Now it happened that while he was performing his priestly service before God in the appointed order of his division, according to the custom of the priestly office, he was chosen by lot to enter the temple of the Lord and burn incense. So the priest had several different jobs, right? And once again, I'm not trying to focus in on the Old Testament, but just understanding um, who Zechariah actually was. Um, so in Exodus 37 through 8, we could see that they were commanded that Aaron was the original and he was going to begin the incense. And it says that incense is going to burn day in, day out, 24 hours a day, 365 days a year. It's going to burn year after year after throughout all the generations. That fire is not to go out. And part of that would then be used to burn the incense. So we know that. Zechariah is going in there and he's offering this uh, burnt incense, this burnt offering to the Lord. And then an angel comes and sees him. And it says in verse 11, it says, Now an angel of the Lord appeared to him standing to the right of the altar of incense. Zechariah was troubled when he saw the angel and fear gripped him. But the angel said to him, Do not be afraid, Zechariah, for your prayer has been heard and your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son and you shall name him John. You will have joy and gladness, and many will rejoice over his birth. Right? So we can see that they were godly individuals. Right? God was willing to grant them you know, to have a child. They had been praying, it says, and God has heard their prayers. And because they were loyal and they had nothing wrong found against them, they had adhered to the Old Testament ways, then they were going to be blessed with a child. But just as with Mary was being told... It's a son. And not just that, but you're the name named John. When we go into the Old Testament then, and we start looking at some of the things that are being said, we, it talks about the forerunner of Christ, the forerunner of the Messiah that was going to come. So we have prophecy that's being told, and we can see in Luke chapter 1, 15 through 17, it says, For he will be great in the sight of the Lord, and he will drink no wine or liquor, and he will be filled with the Holy Spirit while still in his mother's womb. So the angel is giving Zechariah very specific directions about his son that he will have in the world in about three months. He says, and he will turn many of the sons of Israel back to the Lord, their God. And it is he who will go out, go as a forerunner before him in the spirit and power of Elijah 
to turn the hearts of fathers back to their children than the disobedient to the attitude of the righteous to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. Now, if your um, translation is written the same way mine is, then you can see it's different it italics and it's different fonts because they're showing us that the angel is speaking prophecy here. He is quoting scripture from the Old Testament times. Scripture that many of them would know, and especially um, Zechariah, who was one of the priests. When we go to Isaiah, he's using these scriptures from um, chapter 40. It says, the voice of one is calling out, clear the way of the Lord in the wilderness. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Let every valley be lifted up and every mountain and hill be made low. And let the uneven ground become a plain and the rugged terrain a broad valley. Then the glory of the Lord will be revealed, and all flesh will see it together. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken. Right? And it's very poetic um, in many of the writings that he does, but it's basically talking about we're, we're going to be putting on an even playing field for every individual. Right? we got to make way for all those who are going to believe in God, follow God, and believe in his Son to be able to have salvation. Malachi, then, is very specific about things. It says, Behold, I am sending my messenger, and he will clear a way before me. And the Lord whom you are seeking will suddenly come to his temple, and the messenger of the covenant in whom you delight, behold, he is coming, says the Lord of armies. And then he says in 4 or 5, Behold, I am going to send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and terrible day of the Lord. Right? So when we wrap all those up and we look at what the angel was telling Zechariah, these prophecies that have been told, this is your son. This is your son that Elizabeth has conceived, and you will name him John. Jesus himself later on in Matthew eleven fourteen, is talking to the individual that John has been put into prison, is going to be tried, and eventually is going to be beheaded. And they come, the followers of John, and they're talking to him, and Jesus begins to explain to them about John and his importance and the role in which he played. And he tells them as they're there, and he says in verse 14, and if you're willing to accept it, John himself is Elijah who was to come. Confirming what the Old Testament prophecies have said, confirming what the angel had told Zechariah, and now he's confirming in front of all of them that he is the messenger. He is the Elijah, the power of Elijah coming forth to prepare the way me, he said. When we look at the idea of baptism then, this is a very strange and bizarre thing to introduce because that is not how they had sins forgiven up to this point. Right? We're still under the Old Testament law at this time. And the idea of salvation was I'm going to take my offering, I'm going to take it to the temple, it's going to be offered up every year and it's going to be postponed year after year after year after year. And now he's got a different thing that he's presenting. In Luke 1, 76 and 79, we can see where um, Zechariah is speaking to his son at the day of his circumcision. Right? So up to this point, Zechariah had been mute because he started questioning the angel. He's like, how am I going to know these things are going to come to pass? And so once the time comes, the eighth day, when uh, John is to be circumcised, they asked for his name. And Elizabeth says, well, his name's going to be John. And they just, they're not having that, right? Because tradition is you're named after your father or your lineage. And there's no one in his lineage named John. And Zechariah writes down, his name will be John. From that moment, it says that his, two, or his tongue was loose. He was able to talk suddenly. And then he begins to talk to his child and explain these things which are to come. He says, And you, child, also will be called the prophet of the Most High, for you will go on before the Lord and prepare his ways, to give his people the knowledge of salvation by the forgiveness of their sins, because of the tender mercy of our God with which the sunrise from on high will visit us, to shine on those who sit in darkness and the shadow of death, to guide our feet into the way of peace. Right? And peace is one of those things that the Jews just really didn't have underneath the uh, Roman authority. So they had constant struggles within themselves and then trying to adhere to 
uh, the Mosaic laws as well as these new laws and restrictions that they were putting on the people, there, they didn't know peace. And here we have Zechariah who's you know, blessed by the Holy Spirit to say these words and they didn't understand even what that plan was and how it was going to work. But it's a promise that peace was going to be granted to all. When we go over to Luke chapter 3 then, we can see where John begins to preach. It says now in verse 1, Now in the fifteenth year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, when Pontius Pilate was governor of Judea, and Herod was tetrarch of Galilee, and his brother Philip was tetra tetrarch of the region of Iturea, I don't know that word, and the other one, and the other one. Anyway, there was a tetrarch in the high priesthood of Annas the Anchiaphas. Says that the word came, the word of God came to John. Right, so we can see that the Holy Spirit has blessed John. He now has this um, explanation, these words that are put inside of his head into his heart. It says the son of Zechariah, confirming that we're speaking of John the Baptist, and he was in the wilderness. It says and he came into all the region around the Jordan, preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sin. So up to this point, they, they've only had their sacrifices. It was the only way they were going to be forgiven. And it had to be done every year because it couldn't be a perfect sacrifice. I don't care how wealthy the individual was, what kind of resources they had, no matter what they offered up, it couldn't be perfect. Right? And the only thing that was going to work was a perfect sacrifice. And now he's saying, well, we're going to get to a point where, you know, these sacrifices, they're not even going to be needed. There's only going to be one. And how you have your sins forgiven now is you're going to be baptized. You're going to be put down into the water. You're going to be drenched. You're going to come up. And God's going to forgive your sins. Right? And I'm sure that they were kind of thinking he was a little strange, a little weird, a little different. Right? If we think about how some people look at us when we start talking about Christianity and being baptized and how we partake of the, the bread and the fruit of the vine each and every Lord's Day because it's the blood and the body of Christ. And there are times that if they don't have any exposure to Christianity, they kind of look at us like we're a little weird. Right? But that's okay because this is what God has asked. When we continue on in verses 10 or 4 through 10 then, he begins to talk and says, as it is written in the book of the words of Isaiah the prophet, the voice of one calling out in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. Every ravine will be filled. Every mountain and hill will be lowered. The crooked will become straight and the rough road smooth and all flesh will see the salvation of God. All right. So not only is he now preaching about baptism, but he's also talking about how now salvation is going to be brought forward, not just to the Jews, but also to the Gentiles. That's unheard of. Because only God is the God of the children of Israel. He's not the God of everyone else. That's what they believed. That's because oftentimes their heart was just not in the right place. And they didn't really listen to what the words of God had said. Right? All the way back in the Old Testament, it had said that God was the God of all. And he wanted all to be saved. He wanted all of them to serve him. It wasn't just a certain specific group of people. The idea that salvation is not now brought to everyone probably raised a few eyebrows. When we continue in verse 7, then it says, So he was saying to the crowds who were going out to be baptized by him, You offspring of vipers who warned you to flee from the wrath to come. Therefore, produce fruits that are consistent with repentance. And do not start saying to yourself, We have Abraham as our father. For I say to you that from these stones God is able to raise up children for Abraham. But indeed, the axe is already being laid at the root of the trees. So every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Right? And up to this point, even at the time of John's life, the lineage back to Abraham was vital. Those were the individuals that could live in Jerusalem, the city itself. If you could not prove your lineage went back to Abraham... You couldn't live inside the walls. You had to live in the outskirts of the walls. Everything in their traditions and in their culture hung on the fact that they could go all the way back to Abraham. And now here's John going, 
that's no longer going to be important. Right? That connection to Abraham is soon going to be gone because there's an axe that's going to chop away at those roots and it's going to be gone. It's not going to matter anymore. But where we can really look at John the Baptist and how that can apply and should apply to us is the belief that John had. Right? As John the believer, when we look at verses 15 and 16, we can see where he had been talking about the Lamb of God that was going to come. Right? He tells his followers, and he's got a large crowd of followers who believe in him who believe in the salvation, who believe in this baptism, and believe that God is offering salvation to all individuals. He says, now while the people were in a state of expectation, and they all were thinking carefully in their hearts about John, where, whether he himself perhaps was the Christ, John responded to them all saying, As for me, I baptize you with water, but he is coming. Who is mightier than I. And I am not fit to untie the straps of his sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand. To thoroughly clear his, his threshing floor. And to gather the wheat into the barn. He will burn up the chaff. And unquench, with unquenchable fire. So he understands that they are wondering now. Is he the Christ? Because right? once again, they've been taught since they were little children what the Old Testament was and what they were looking for in the Messiah and that the Christ was going to come and he was going to lead them all, right? That, they, that he would conquer the world. And as they began to question that, he says, it's not me. I'm here to lead the world. I'm here to prepare you. I'm here to open your mind and your heart to hear what he has to say. I'm here to serve. In verse 28 of John 1, it says, These things took place in Bethany beyond the Jordan where John was baptizing people. The next day he saw Jesus coming to him and, and said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is he in, be, in behalf of whom I said, After me is coming a man who was proved to be my superior because he existed before me. And I did not recognize him, but so that he would be revealed to Israel, I came baptizing in water. So when we look at the uh, hierarchy, the traditions of the Jewish religion, and it still continues today in a lot of the Middle Eastern countries, the firstborn is the most important. Right? On both sides, my mom and my dad's side of the family, I, I'm like way down here. Definitely not the oldest. So, my importance wouldn't have been very great in the family. Right? But John is saying, I'm older, I recognize I'm older, but I have no authority over him. Because when it comes down to it, he came way before I did. Right? He's acknowledging that he's been there since the beginning of time. He realizes now that Jesus is the Christ, he is the Messiah. Yeah, he's his cousin, he's his relative, right? And he's his younger relative, but he has no authority over him. Right? He recognizes that Jesus himself has more authority than he does or anyone else. So when we start looking at John the Baptist and his followers and his belief and what he's trying to do for God and for the Christ, then he becomes a believer himself and he proclaims to the people, this is the Christ. This is the Son of God. And I'm not worthy to, to even untie his shoes. Right? He recognizes that Jesus has all authority over all, not just him. When we go down to verse 32, it says, And then John testified, saying, See, I have seen the Spirit descending as a dove out of heaven, and he remained upon him. And I did not recognize him, but... He who sent me to baptize in water said to me, He upon whom you see the Spirit descending and remaining upon him, this is the one who baptizes in the Holy Spirit. So John is able to recognize now Jesus for who he is, that he is the Christ, he is the Messiah, because God has said, hey, this is what you're looking for. You're going to get a vision. Right? You're going to see a dove descend upon him. 
and that'll be my sign to you. He is the one that's going to baptize in the Holy Spirit. And then he says, and I myself have seen and have testified that this is the Son of God. Right? He has the greatest confession that we can possibly give in our life. Jesus is the Son of God, and he has a mission, and he has a goal for each and every one of us. When we see how he continued to serve Jesus, in Matthew 3, 13 through 16, the background image that I have is actually from um, the River Jordan in Israel. Some people say this is the spot in which Jesus was baptized, but I have no evidence of that, and they have no evidence of that, but I know it's from the River Jordan, so I'm using this picture. But in Matthew 3, 13, it says, Then Jesus arrived to Galilee at the Jordan, coming to John to be baptized by him. But John tried to prevent him, saying, I have the need to be baptized by you, and yet you are coming to me? Right? He recognizes that John, or that Jesus, has greater power than him. That he is the Messiah, he is the Christ, and, and he is willing to serve. And he wants to serve. And he's like, no, I need you to baptize me. Right? But Jesus says, allow it all this time, for in this way it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. And then he allowed him. Right? His simple word just said, hey, John, let it happen. It needs to happen. All righteousness is going to be fulfilled through this moment. And so John baptizes his cousin, Jesus. He says, after he was baptized, Jesus came up immediately from the water. And behold, the heavens were opened. And he saw the Spirit of God descending as a dove and settling on him. Just as he had said he had seen himself. And behold, a voice from the heaven said, This is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. So we have all these followers. We have John the Baptist himself. They're all gathered together, and they watch Jesus get baptized by John. And then we have confirmation. They see a dove descending down and a light over Jesus, which was the Spirit of God. And then God himself speaks out. He says, This is my Son. I am pleased in what he has done. He set the example for us. So at the moment that Jesus is baptized, we have the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit united as one, showing that this is important. Right? Unfortunately, there are people in this world today that don't believe that baptism is important. Yet Jesus allowed himself to be baptized by John, not for the remission of sins, but setting that example. And God and the Holy Spirit confirm that this is important. John was willing to serve. When we look at John 3, 22 through 36, it says, After these things, Jesus and his disciples came into the land of Judea, and there he was spending time with them and baptizing. Now John also was baptizing in Anon and near Salim, because there was an abundance of water there, and people were coming and being baptized. For John had not yet been thrown into prison. Then a matter of dispute developed on the part of John's disciples with a Jew about purification. And they came to John and said to him, Rabbi, he who was with you beyond the Jordan to whom you have testified, behold, he is baptizing and all the people are coming to him. Now, we often see in our world today that people will spend so much time to get power and authority. And when that becomes threatened, they pick up their effort. John the Baptist was a faithful servant, and he was a believer that Jesus was the Christ and the Son of God. Right? His disciples were upset because the disciples of John the Baptist had grown over time as he began to talk about salvation, forgiveness of sins, right? being baptized, and having your sins forget all of this that he was bringing forth, and his group was growing, and then all of a sudden... This person that you baptized, this person that you were with, he, he's now taking people from us. His group's growing. And John is on a road, and he can choose which path that he wants to go down. Luckily, John isn't like most of us, um, or not, I'm not going to say most of us, but most of the people in the world that seem to uh, want so much power. Because John replies, a person can receive not even one thing 
unless it has been given to him from heaven. You yourselves are my witnesses that I said, I am not the Christ, but I have been sent ahead of him. He who was the bride is the groom, but the friend of the groom who stands and listens to him rejoices greatly because of the groom's voice. So this joy of mine has been made full. He must increase, but I must decrease. John recognized it's not about him. And it never was. That's not what was important. Jesus is what was important. And he allows Jesus to grow. And he realizes that his followers should decrease. He says, he who comes from above is above all. And the one who is only from the earth is of the earth and speaks of the earth. He who comes from heaven is above all. What he has seen and heard of, of this, he testifies. And no one accepts his testimony. So I'm saying I, I'm just simply human. That's it. That's all I am. And I was given this position in life to serve and to lead the way, and I've done it. He's going to be preaching far more than what I could ever preach to you. Because he's from heaven. And he knows God. And he is God. The one who has accepted his testimony has certified that God is true. For he whom God sent speaks the words of God. For he does not give the Spirit sparingly. Meaning not everyone gets the blessing. Right? Not everyone gets salvation. It says the Father loves the Son and has entrusted all things to his hand. The one who believes in the Son has eternal life. But the one who does not obey the Son will not see life. But the wrath of God remains on him. Imagine what you are just now hearing. You have chosen to follow John the Baptist. Right? He's come forth and he starts talking about this repentance, this plan of salvation, this baptism, which they didn't have anything before. Right? He starts talking about how your lineage no longer matters. Right? Because Abraham's lineage is just going to be put away. And this individual over here, he is God down here on earth. He is the promised Messiah. He is the Christ. And he's coming to save. And you had better listen to him and stop listening to him. I don't know how long he was out preaching and I don't know what, how big his crowd was but it was obvious these people had dedicated themselves into following him and being faithful to his teaching and now he's saying I'm done I've done my job and it's time for you to move on he was an important individual he was prophesied about and he came and he did what he was supposed to do but when he had that choice he continued to serve Instead of taking advantage of the world and getting the world's authority. When it comes to us as individuals when we're baptized, then you know we don't have a lineage back to Abraham because we don't need it. Right? We have a lineage of Christians, from the Christians that came before us and before them and before them, all the way back to Jesus himself dying on the cross for us. That's the lineage that matters. When we follow the forerunners that come before us, we follow the individuals who have preached the gospel from the moment they were told to. We can see in Acts 2 that Peter began to preach the gospel. And from that forward, that message has continued. He was a forerunner, and every apostle was a forerunner, and every preacher since has been a forerunner. And we continue to apply that into our lives. And we should. Because salvation is what's important to every one of us. And when the disciples were told to go and preach and baptize in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, that's what we're to do. Now, you're not going to be judged wrongly if you aren't physically baptizing individuals. Right? But leading them to Christ, leading them to understand why Jesus had to come and die for them, and how important baptism is. It's a key to their salvation. And God wants all individuals to gain heaven. Just simply testifying that you are a believer. That you recognize who Jesus is. Right. found it interesting this morning because I was leading the adult, or not the adult, but the um, grown kids class. Can't think of what they're, teenage class maybe. And we were talking about some of the physical evidence that's out there. Um, and we talked about Josephus. And we talked about Tacitus. And 
then Andrew was started preaching and Logan leans forward and he's like, he's talking about what you talked about. My son was listening. I was pretty happy. But some people just don't believe that. They don't want to believe what, what there's evidence of around them. Right? So if we just simply testify, I am a believer. I believe in what God's word says. It is the truth. Jesus is the way. And it's through him that I get life, eternal. We're doing what we need to do. And in the same way that John the Baptist had a choice, he could go down one path or go down the He chose the straight and narrow. He's like, all right, my time's done. Right? I'm going to serve Jesus, and you need to serve Jesus. And as baptized individuals, that it's our choice as well. This evening, if you haven't been baptized, then you're on that road. You have a choice that you need to make. Because right now, salvation just simply is not yours. It can't be yours until you take on the death, burial, and resurrection that Jesus has brought forth. He was baptized as an example for us so that we know the importance that it possesses. If you've fallen away from the church and you need to ask for forgiveness um, or repent of your sins, we're always going to offer that opportunity also. Won't you come forward as we stand and sing?